Well, a number of years ago, when our four boys were quite young, we had a pet fish. How many of you have tried to keep fish? We actually had a number of fish uh, in rapid succession, each one meeting a rather untimely demise until we realized we weren't very good at the fish thing. We moved on to lizards, a couple of hamsters, eventually a dog. But at one time we had an angel fish, creatively named Angel, who lived in a small tank on the dresser in one of our boys' rooms. And one night, as I recall, I was putting our older boys to bed when our youngest, who was about two and a half at the time, just a little guy, came bursting into the room. And I was a little bit annoyed because he was supposed to be in his room already asleep because I'd already put him to bed. But he comes bursting in. I say, what do you need, buddy? He says, made a mess, Daddy. Made a mess. And so I said, well, go back to your room. Get your bed. I'll be there in just a minute. But as he turned to leave, something piqued my curiosity. I said, what, what, wait, what kind of mess? He turned around, his eyes got really big, and he said, with the fish. <laughs> and that got my attention, so I ran in the room, found out he had decided after I'd put him to bed to feed the fish. So he pushed the chair over to the dresser, and he picked up the canister of fish food, and the top popped off, and he dumped the entire canister of fish food flakes into the little tank. And there was now a two-inch thick sludge of fish food floating on the top of the tank. I looked underneath the angel. The angel fish was just gulping down fish food as fast as possible. And I'm not a marine biologist, but I didn't think that was a very good thing. Sure enough, uh, by the next morning, I did the best I could to clean it up. But by the next morning, angel, the angel fish was a little sluggish. And by that very next evening, angel was stiff floating on the surface. So I had to break the news to the boys that Angel the Angelfish had expired, probably from complications due to overeating. <laughs> we gave Angel a somber bathroom burial at sea, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Sometime later it occurred to me, though, that we had just encountered the two fundamental problems of human existence. The first problem was my son's. He had made a mess that he couldn't clean up by himself. The second problem was Angel the Angelfish's problem. Today there's a fish in the tank, tomorrow the fish is no more. Life is temporary, fragile, slips through our fingers like water, and death is inevitable. The great story we celebrate today is, in fact, God's answer to both of those problems. Listen as I read the story as it comes to us in Luke chapter 24. I'll stop to explain a couple of things along the way. Luke 24, on the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday in that culture because Saturday was the Sabbath day, uh, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Now the Gospels tell us that Jesus had died at about three in the afternoon on the day before the Sabbath, and since the Sabbath began, actually the evening at sundown, there wasn't much time to uh, deal with his body for proper burial. Uh, two prominent men, we are told, Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus had requested permission from Pilate to take Jesus' body. It had been granted, and so they did the best they could with the time allowed. They wrapped his body in linen and spices and placed it in Joseph's own personal tomb. Sabbath day came and went because they did nothing on the Sabbath day. And on Sunday morning, first day of the week, several of the women are hoping to finish the job of preparing Jesus' body. Now, we can miss this in our culture because we're so used to the story, but it's extremely significant that women were the first to witness the empty tomb. And that's because in that day and time, in that culture, uh, the testimony of a woman was not regarded as reliable, not even admissible in a court of law. So if the story were being created, manufactured, there's no way an ancient Jewish writer would put women at the tomb first because by definition, the story would have been unreliable or unbelievable. Therefore, the easiest, simplest conclusion is this is actually the way everything took place. Verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, traditionally, it's thought to be a large, round stone. This isn't the actual tomb, but one like it in the ancient world. The stone probably weighed between one and two tons, was rolled into place uh, by several uh, strong men. Verse 3, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. 
Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. Familiar story. But the first thing I want to point out to you today is a curious question. We start with a curious question. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I traveled to Dallas, Texas to watch one of our boys play college baseball. And I wonder how many of you recognize the building in this picture. Anybody recognize that? It's a little dark, but that's me standing in front of what is called the Texas School Book Depository Building, the former Texas School Book Depository Building in Dealey Plaza in Dallas. And the top window above my head, up top to the right, is the window from which Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly shot the, uh, fired the shots that killed the 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Now, I had never been there before. How many of you have been to Dealey Plaza? Anybody? Well, I'd never been before, and I've always been fascinated by the whole story. I was just seven years old in November of 1963 when the president was killed, and I still remember following the story on TV and seeing the adults around me respond, my teacher at school and so forth. But two things struck me about standing in Dealey Plaza just a couple of weeks ago. First is how small the whole area is. It just surprised me. I mean, the distance from the window to the presidential limousine was about 60 yards or so. I remember thinking, you could throw a rock and hit him from here, let alone have a high-powered rifle. It was small. But the second thing I noticed were all the other people who were there like me, just walking around, walking around the plaza, on the sidewalk, on the grassy knoll, staring at the building, just visiting there. It's been almost 55 years since that day. And every day, hundreds of people visit that site. Over a million a year for 55 years. Why, I wondered. Trying to connect somehow with the past, trying to imagine what it would have been like, trying to remember a dead president. Verse 4, Luke writes, While they were still wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? First thing we notice, obviously, is the two men in bright clothing are angels. Now, throughout Scripture, angels are presented to us as supernatural beings who are messengers of God. And in the New Testament, the main place we see the angels is when they announce the birth of Jesus Christ, the great multitude of the heavenly hosts singing and praising God. Now here, their purpose is to announce his resurrection from the dead. The second thing we notice is what I'm calling today a curious question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? I think the question had to be a little bit confusing to these women. After all, they had not come looking for the living. They had come looking for the dead among the dead. They were prepared to anoint a dead body and prepare it for proper burial. So why the strange question? Well, I think that the question is actually a kind of a statement. The angels are really saying, you've come to a tomb, the place of the dead, looking for a dead man, but the one you're looking for is alive. In other words, you're looking for the right person, but you're looking in the wrong place. I also think we can hear a kind of gentle rebuke in the question. Why do you believe death? Why do you believe his death is the end? Why do you believe this is the end of Jesus' story? Don't you remember that he once said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Don't you remember that he then called Lazarus, his friend, out of the tomb, back from the dead just by speaking his name? Don't you remember his promise? Luke has told us that just weeks earlier, Jesus said, the Son of Man may suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Don't you remember? But I think on a more personal level, questions or several questions come to us through this question. Why do you seek life in that which brings spiritual death? Why do you seek life in that which brings spiritual death? Death. I saw uh, the news this week of the release of the toxicology report 
on the singer pop artist Prince, who died back in 2006 when he collapsed at his home at the age of 57. But they just released the toxicology report. Did you see that? He had massive amounts of the drug fentanyl in his system. Now, fentanyl is a synthetic drug 50 times more powerful than heroin. So now the medical examiner says that Prince died of an accidental overdose of a recreational drug. Why do you seek life in that which brings death, the question says. Or why do you seek to satisfy the deepest longings of your soul and that which is superficial and temporary? We live in a culture bombarded every day with messages, advertisements that promise, in effect, happiness and fulfillment through Stuff, things, everything from soft drinks to new cars. Coca-Cola says, open happiness. Volkswagen says, get in, get happy. How about this one? Change your life with bacon. (laughs) Now, some of you are saying, hey, don't mess with my bacon. That's bacon, right? (laughs) Or consider our cultural addiction to entertainment. We have now literally trying to use that word the way it used to be used, thousands of television channels, right? Comcast Cable, uh, Netflix, DirecTV, YouTube, Hulu, and many, many others. Add that to movies and theaters, around-the-clock news, weather and sports. We are quite likely the most over-entertained people in the history of human civilization. And yet, I ask you, if you look around at our culture, are we any happier as a culture Or any more fulfilled? I think the answer is, I don't think so. So the question is very contemporary. And it's personal. Why do you seek the living among the dead? The second thing we see in the story is a shocking announcement. What I'm calling a shocking announcement. In the summer of 1996, I traveled with a group from our church to Russia to visit what was then our sister church in a place called Samara, about 400 miles southeast of Moscow. But on the way, we were able to stop in Moscow for a day, do some sightseeing. It was a great experience. So we got to see Red Square and all the famous stuff, the Kremlin and St. Basil's Cathedral. And our tour guide asked us, do you want to see Lenin's tomb? So we're like, sure. We're in Moscow. You've got to see Lenin's tomb. So we stood in this long line, got into the building, and a very stern-looking military uh, police officer-looking guy confiscated our cameras, didn't have phones that took pictures at that time, Uh, and they directed us to this large darkened room, and there he was, the embalmed body of Vladimir Lenin, leader of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, bald head, neatly trimmed little beard, I recognized him, lying there in a plexiglass case, kind of creepy, but I had to admit, he looked pretty good for a guy who'd been dead 70 years. (laughs) I remember really wishing I could speak Russian, this is just how I think. I really wanted to sidle up next to one of these, you know, Red Army guys holding a submachine gun and say, hey, doesn't he look so natural? That's what people say at funerals all the time. Didn't he do a good job? He looks natural. But imagine if we had waited in line, got to the entrance, and the guard said, who are you looking for? We said, we'd like to see Comrade Lennon, please. He said, well, he's not here. We would have just assumed that we went to the wrong building. Turn right, we should have turned left. Or maybe they had moved to another place. We would not have expected what comes next in the story. Verse 6, he is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he's still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Now, all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give their version of the story of the resurrection. Interestingly, they all each give slightly different details, which you would expect from eyewitness testimony, right? But they all tell the same story. First, the women were there first. That's surprising. We already covered that. The stone has been moved. That's even more surprising because it had been guarded and sealed by the Romans. Third, uh, there are angels there with a message. That's very, very surprising. And fourthly, the tomb is empty. And that's more than surprising. That's a shock. This is the central, unarguable fact of the story that we celebrate today. The tomb of Jesus of Nazareth was empty. The Jewish leadership did not dispute that fact. The Roman government did not dispute that fact. Now, they did offer differing explanations of the fact, But no one disputed at the time that tomb was empty. 
Now, over the centuries, uh, there have been all kinds of explanations and, and um, objections offered, including, and I'll just tick through some of these, the women went to the wrong tomb. They were confused, emotional, went to the wrong tomb. That'd be like forgetting where JFK is buried, right? Forgetting where they put Lenin. But even assuming they went to the wrong tomb, all the Romans had to do, all Pilate had to do, all the Jewish leaders had to do was say, oh, here's the right tomb, here's the body. Or Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. He just passed out and later revived, and despite massive trauma and blood loss, without food and water for 48 hours, having a spear thrust to his lungs and heart, he managed to revive, gather the strength to push aside a two-ton stone and disappear into history. Some believe that. Mass hallucination. I even saw this one this week. Jesus had an unknown twin brother. Or the most common explanation, the body was stolen by his disciples, who then fabricated the entire hoax and foisted it upon human history. Now, to believe this, you have to believe that the disciples, who were actually cowering in fear, managed to put together a coordinated plan to overwhelm or sneak past a Roman squadron of 16 trained and armed guards, roll away a two-stone two-ton stone, drag a, a dead body out past the guards, dispose of the body in a way that can never be found, make a pact to carry that secret to their graves despite torture and death, find a way then to convince their greatest enemy, Saul of Tarsus, to become an apostle of the message of a man raised from the dead that they knew to be dead. Now I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know you're here today because you believe the story, but sometimes we can lose confidence in our belief in the resurrection because we live in a culture that tells us you're crazy. That's a fairy tale. How can you believe that? So how can we believe something as audacious as resurrection from the dead? What if I ask a different question? What if I ask who was Theodore Roosevelt? Teddy Roosevelt died in 1919, so my guess is no one here actually knew Teddy Roosevelt. Dr. Holm, I'm pretty sure. He didn't. <laughs> but we can know with great certainty the facts about his life. We have his, the historical record, his birth, his death. We have eyewitness testimony to the things he did and said. Did you know, by the way, and I didn't know this until I read a little bit, I'd forgotten. Did you know that he once was shot in the chest an assassination attempt, but refused to go to the hospital until he gave a 90-minute speech that was planned. Then he went to the hospital. Now that's a president, right? <laughs> Did you know that the earliest copies of the New Testament that we have, copies of parts of the Gospel of John, date to about 125 A.D., about 90 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, or about 60 years after John actually wrote the originals and John was an eyewitness. Teddy Roosevelt died 100 years ago. And we can know the details of his life with relative certainty. And in much the same way, we can know who Jesus is. What he said. What he did. Through the historical account of his life, written by eyewitnesses and handed down to us through the years. The point is this. Jesus is not an imaginary figure of religious mythology. And the resurrection is not mythology either. Think about it this way. How much evidence would we need to believe that Teddy Roosevelt actually lived? How much evidence would you need today to know that Vladimir Lenin is still dead? If we go back to Lenin's tomb for a minute. Let's say we get there, the guards say, he is not here. We would just assume he was in some other place. But if they follow with the next line, he is risen that would change everything, right? And this is the center of our faith. The Apostle Paul makes it quite clear, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. We're wasting our time. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Make no mistake, the center of our faith is not be kind and love your neighbor. That's a good thing. That's an outcome of our faith. That's not the center of it. The center of our faith is not follow the moral teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. He was a great teacher. Those are good things, but that's not the center. 
The center of our faith is not becoming really, really good people, although that's a good thing. The center of our faith is death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. You cannot explain the explosion of and survival of Christianity in the world without the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And that leads us to the third thing we see in the story, the reminder to remember. A reminder to remember. Verse 6, remember, the angel says, how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. The angel says, remember how he told you. Remember, he told you how he would be given over. He told you how he would be put to death. He told you he would rise again. Remember? And then it says, and they remembered his words. What is faith? How do you define faith? It seems to me that faith is remembering what is true. Faith is remembering what is true. Faith is trusting in a promise that has been made and in the one who makes the promise. The resurrection of Christ brings us three promises today. First, the promise that death is not final. Death is not final. Some 20 years ago or so, I got a call asking me if I would visit a man who I don't think had ever come to our church at that time, but he was in his... um, Late 40s, early 50s, very young, but very sick. Final stages of cancer in the hospital. So I went to visit him. Um, he had some church in his background, but had, had, um, through the course of our conversation, I learned, had not really responded personally to the gospel, didn't really understand that, and was fearful. And so we had a conversation, and I just remember outlining the, the truth of the gospel, the promise of the resurrection, and at the, at the end of our time together, I asked if he wanted to pray to trust Christ, and he did. So we prayed right there in the hospital room. Simple. And I never saw him again because within a couple of weeks, he passed away. Subsequent to that, I got a letter that I've kept all these years from his sister, who has never been to our church. She wrote, Dear Brian, I know just these things about you. You are the pastor of the First Baptist Church, and you saved my brother's life. Now, this is the gospel. It's not, not me, right? But that's how she wrote it. She went on to say, I was so afraid that my brother would leave us missing the greatest gift of all, the gift of eternal life. The day after you visited, he called me. He said, I just wanted you to know you don't have to worry about me anymore. The pastor was here yesterday, and I'm at peace with God. I'm ready. I kept that letter for all these years because it reminds me of the power of the promise. Even death is not final. Secondly, the promise is our failures are not hopeless. Later, a few days after the resurrection, Luke tells us this. Then he opened their minds, Jesus, so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. The truth is, we've all made a mess that we can't clean up by ourselves. The mess is called sin. But the resurrection tells us there is one who can and one who has. The forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Even our failures are not hopeless. And finally, the promise is we are not alone. We are not alone. In Mark 16, the angel gives a little more specific message. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And then the Gospels tell us Jesus, the risen Jesus, did exactly that. First he appeared to Mary. Then he walks with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Then he shares a meal with the disciples. And then he shows himself to Thomas. And then to 500 at one time. And then 40 days later, he promises to send the Holy Spirit to be with them forever. And by the way, next weekend, we begin a nine-week series 
on the Holy Spirit that we can't wait to start because that's what Jesus promised. That's how he is with us forever. I've told stories about my dad's life before, but his father died when he was only five years old, leaving a widow and six children in post-depression America. My dad has very few memories of that part of his life. He tries, but he has very few memories. It was a bleak and sad time. He does remember the summer after his father died, his mother sent him to live with a grandmother in a small farm out in the country. He knows now that she did that out of love because his grandmother could care for him, could feed him, and she couldn't. But he also just remembers at six years old being alone and afraid and by himself. And he knew that his oldest brother, Bill, was 18 and drove a milk truck. And so in his six-year-old mind, he figured that sooner or later his brother would have to drive that truck by that country farm when in truth his brother's route was far, far away. But every day after doing his chores, he would go out and sit by the country road all afternoon and wait for his brother to drive by, hoping he could, he could wave. His brother would wave back and he'd feel a little less alone. But all summer, his big brother never came. But a few years later, my dad was about 15. He was invited with his buddies to go to a Methodist revival meeting. There he heard the gospel for the first time, and he met Jesus. And if you could ask him today at age 84, almost 85, he would say, since that day, he's never been alone again. See, I think that's how the disciples may have felt, lonely and fearful in despair when they were hiding on Friday night and Saturday. I think that's how the women felt when they went to the tomb that morning to prepare a dead body. I think we all know what it's like to feel lost and alone and afraid. Afraid we've made a mess that we can't clean up. But here's the center of the story. If Christ is raised, then our sins can be forgiven. If Christ is risen, our failures are not hopeless. If Christ is risen, even death is not final. If Christ is risen, we are not alone. And if Christ is risen, as Philip Yancey writes, hope flows like lava beneath the crust of everyday life. How can we say this? How can we believe this? Because somewhere outside the ancient wall of Jerusalem, there is a tomb carved out of limestone. The tomb in which one day the lifeless body of Jesus of Nazareth was laid. But he is not there because he is risen. Hallelujah, he is risen. Will you bow with me as we close? Lord, I we thank you for what we remember and celebrate today. We thank you for the power of your resurrection life that exploded from that ancient tomb and cascades down through the centuries into this room this morning. And may the truth of your resurrection seal forever your promises in our hearts and minds, the promise of forgiveness the promise of eternal life and the promise of your presence forever with us. It's in your name that we pray today. Amen.